in order to understand the subject of the dead, for consolation of those who mourn for the loss of their friends, it is necessary we should understand the character and being of God and how he came to be so. For I am going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. These are incomprehensible ideas to some, but they are simple. It is the first principle of the gospel to know for a certainty the character of God and to know that we may converse with him as one man converses with another and that he was once a man like us. Yea, the God himself, the God, the, the Father of us all, dwelt on earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did, and I will show it from the Bible. I wish I was in a suitable place to tell it, and that I had the trump of an archangel, so that I could tell the story in such a manner that persecution would cease forever. What did Jesus say? Mark it, Elder Rigdon. The scriptures inform us that Jesus said, As the Father hath power in himself, even so hath the Son power. To do what? Why, what the Father did. The answer is obvious, in a manner to lay down his body and to take it up again. Jesus, what are you going to do? To lay down my life as my Father did and take it up again. Do we believe it? If you do not believe it, you do not believe the Bible. The scriptures say it, and I defy all the learning and wisdom and all the combined powers of earth and hell together to refute it. Here, then, is eternal life, to know the only wise and true God, and you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves, and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you, namely, by going from one small degree to another, and from a small capacity to a great one, from grace to grace, from exaltation to exaltation, until you attain to the resurrection of the dead, and are able to dwell in everlasting burnings, and to sit in glory, as do those who sit in in everlasting power. They shall be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. What is it? To inherit the same power, the same glory, and the same exaltation until you arrive at the station of a God and ascend the throne of eternal power, the same as those who have gone before. This is an excerpt from a sermon preached by Joseph Smith in 1844. It's titled The King Follett Discourse, often referred to as the King Follett Sermon. And as you heard in here, Joseph Smith was very directly teaching that God is not the only God. When I say God, I'm referring to the creator of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who led his people out of slavery in Egypt, um, the God who was and is and is to come, uh, the God that is often referred to as Elohim in modern Mormonism. Joseph Smith says, without any mincing of words here, that God is not the only God, that he was once like Jesus was, he attained to his status and position and power, and that we too, following in the example of himself, of Jesus, can attain to exaltation and have everything that they have, the power, the station, the glory, all of those things. Here on the GLM podcast, we want to help Mormons understand the Christian faith. We think it is important to test the prophets to examine their teachings against what God has revealed in his word, in scripture, to see whether these prophets are from God. Statements like these that Joseph Smith made are really important for Latter-day Saints to recognize is a part of the heritage of their church. Mormonism has taught that God is a man and that men can become gods. To summarize, or, or to, to quote Lorenzo Snow, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. And as Christians, we think that this is an abomination, quite frankly, that this is totally contrary to what God has revealed about himself. So much so that to believe this kind of thing is to make oneself not a Christian, to not abide in the teachings of Christ and not have eternal life. It is uh, very technically a heresy to believe that God was once a man and that men can become gods. And therefore, it is important for us to study what scripture says about this. Joseph Smith said in this sermon, let's see if I can find it real quick, that it is um, the first principle of the gospel to know for a certainty the character of God. 
Uh, I agree with that in one sense, obviously not in, with what he was saying, but it is uh, an essential element of Christianity to know the character of God, and that's what we are going to be studying today. My name is Bradley. I'm Garrett. And today we are going to be walking through uh, one of the most helpful sections in the Bible about this topic, Isaiah chapters 40 through 48. We reference these chapters all the time in our other podcast episodes, in some of the mainline videos that we do. We bring up these chapters with people on the street when we're uh, talking with Latter-day, random Latter-day Saints that we meet. These chapters are uh, a cornerstone in a lot of our arguments against the LDS doctrine of exaltation and eternal progression. And we get lots of pushback saying that we're interpreting these verses wrongly, that we're not understanding the context, uh, that, we're n- that we're actually disagreeing with what God has plainly revealed when we put forward our ideas that there only ever has been and only ever will be one creator God who is eternal and unchanging. So to Put to rest some of these arguments, um, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> probably won't happen, but to attempt to put to rest some of these arguments, we thought it would be good to walk through um, these eight chapters, picking out uh, specific verses that give kind of an overall view of uh, what Isaiah is talking about, and then seek to defend our interpretation of these texts. Why is it that Isaiah really does teach that there's only one God and there only ever can be one God. So in chapter 40, verse one, it starts, comfort, comfort my people, says your God, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So the background to this is we have uh, the first part of Isaiah, which is all about the judgment that is to come on Israel for their sins, an encouragement to turn away from it, uh, prophetic um, statements about what is going to happen to Israel, and then there's a historical section which you see some of these things playing out. And now we get to a section in which it is uh, God speaking to his people um, and encouraging them uh, that he, to trust in him for who he is, that he is the only savior that they have, explaining his relationship to them and who he is. So we start with a declaration of comfort for Israel. It's worth noting that in the history of Israel, you know, if you just look at the over, kind of overarching narrative of the Bible, uh, we have this people that God called, uh, starting with Abraham. Uh, out of uh, out of Ur, of the Chaldeans, right? He, he calls Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob. He kind of reaffirms this covenant, this promise, that this sworn oath that he's made to Abraham to bless all nations of the earth through him and to be his God and to multiply him into the father of many nations. And uh, we have this people grow. They, they go to Egypt um, because the whole Joseph narrative and there they multiply. God blesses them like crazy. They're in Egypt. Um, and then, you know, the Exodus story, uh, God calls Moses to be a prophet. We have the burning bush story. God reveals his name, I am that I am. Um, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, has sent Moses to, to bring the people out of slavery. And so that's what happens. They, they come out of slavery. They cross uh, the Red Sea. They come to Sinai where the law of Moses is given. Uh, this is where we have Exodus um, Leviticus, and then beginning of Numbers, and then we have the people wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. After that, the people come into the land of Canaan, into the promised land. Then we have Joshua, where they conquer the land, they, they take the inheritance, um, but they still left some of the people in the land. Then we get Judges and Ruth, the period of the Judges where the people were uh, adopting some of the practices of those that were around them, these other nations, these Canaanites. And what was the primary problem that kept happening to them. Well, idolatry. Idolatry was the chief issue that was uh, prevalent in the days of the judges. We have all these other deities and gods that the peoples worshipped, and because they did not completely drive them out of the land, that was corrupting for the people of Israel. And so we start seeing idolatrous um, uh, practices. We start seeing morality decline. It just rejudges its a wild book. It's Romans 1 on display in narrative form, I like to say. Um, and, and that really sets the stage for what becomes the, the snare for Israel in the next couple books. 
The problem that Israel dealt with is that they were prone to idolatry. And God would save them, he'd rescue them, he would raise up judges and later kings, prophets, and yet the people still had idolatrous hearts. And if we go all the way back to the law of Moses, specifically Deuteronomy, uh, where Moses is recounting the blessings and curses of the Mosaic covenant, of the, the covenant at Sinai, uh, if the people rejected God, if they did not submit to his rule and reign, if they broke the covenant, idolatry was breaking the covenant, that God would drive them out of the land. He would disperse them among the nations. He would cause them to no longer be a nation, uh, that they would crumble as a people into nothingness. And so as the narrative of Israel continues, we have the unified kingdom period, uh, Saul, then David, then Solomon. Um, Saul's days were eh, David's days were good, Solomon's days were Eh. And what was the problem of Solomon? Well, he permitted in the midst of Israel the worship of other deities, especially to appease his many, many wives. After Solomon, the, the nation of Israel splits into the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. Those nations continue for some time, and eventually idolatry just consumes them. The northern kingdom was really got off to a bad start from the very beginning. Uh, they're destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 BC, and the southern kingdom of Judah uh, is taken into exile by the Babylonians in 586 BC. This, the, the beginning parts of Isaiah happened before even the northern kingdom of Israel is taken off into, or is t totally annihilated by the Assyrians. So the, the first 39 chapters um, really give this, this warning against idolatry and this, this prophetic image of what is going to happen. Exile, destruction, the covenant curses that were promised in Deuteronomy is going to come upon the people. So the first 39 chapters of Isaiah are rough. They are intense uh, because God is just issuing judgment after judgment after judgment. Um, and so it kind of ends with this story of Hezekiah, uh, the king of the southern kingdom of Judah, after the northern kingdom has been destroyed by Assyria. He's nervous, worried, justly so, because the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, has come up against Judah to destroy them. And it kind of gives the narrative of how uh, Jerusalem is preserved and saved by God miraculously. Uh, God rescues them from the Assyrian army. After this, Hezekiah shows all of the um, wonders of the temple, uh, all, the, all the gold and riches to envoys from Babylon. Uh, and if you look at Isaiah chapter 39, verses 5 through 8, this is what is said. It says, Isaiah says to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon." Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good, for he thought there will be peace and security in my days. If you go to any commentary or study on Isaiah, um, it, there's pretty much universal consensus that Isaiah is broken up into two parts, chapters 1 through 39 and then chapters 40 through 66. So that ends part one of Isaiah. There's clear thematic differences and a bunch of other things. But what is the ending point of part one? Isaiah comes to the king of Judah and is like, you guys are going to be taken off into exile. You're going to be just wiped off the map. Jerusalem will no longer uh, exist here as, as a city. You, everything that you have will be taken off. Your people will be taken into exile. And so, uh, like Garrett was saying, the, the intro to this section is really profound. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. It's this part two intros with hope, uh, with a reassurance that God has not forsaken his people. Uh, God remembers his covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He will not neglect or forsake his people. He will, he will preserve a remnant, even though they're in Babylon and in exile, he will be kind to them. And it's this context that frames the discussion of the next eight chapters, because he's really going to evaluate uh, his relationship with Israel, and what it is that makes his judgment just. Why is it that he's judged them? Uh, why is it that this has come against them? Because, he'll go on to say, idolatry is stupid. It's really dumb. And it cheapens the nature of God. So just to, sorry, I jumped Don't. in there. A little bit of 
uh, broader context. I also want to point out that uh, the idolatry that the Israelites struggled with, um, the, the issue is not necessarily the you know, bowing down before a little golden statue or something like that. It's not the primary problem. The problem is what the statues represent. It, idolatry is fundamentally the worship of a God other than the one true only God, right? When Elijah had his confrontation with the priests of Baal and they were both trying to call down fire from heaven, um, the idea from the priests of Baal is is not that like, oh, that this little wooden statue is our God or something like that. But no, they were they were praying that Baal, who they believed existed in heaven, would send down fire, right? The they, uh, little wooden statues or gold statues were representations of their gods. It's not that, um, that, uh, that they thought that necessarily that was their god. Um, it was the worship of other gods that was the problem, not the worship of a little thing. The pr- Part of the reason why actually the worship of an idol, um, the physical idol, is such a problem is because it says that God is a creation, is a part of the created order. That's why um, it was so wrong for the golden calf to be made because it's saying that God can be contained and is a part of creation when God transcends creation. And so he doesn't have uh, a body made out of wood or stone or gold or something like that, right? So when we say that Israel is being judged for their idolatry, we don't mean that they were being silly and small-minded because, you know, they were living a long time ago and they thought that this little wooden idol was actually a god. The problem is that they were worshiping and giving their devotion to that which was not worthy of it. So that's that's the first verse. Ah, we're getting real far here. <laughs> Trucking along, one verse. For the record, I'd encourage you to read these eight chapters on your own. We just don't have time to go through verse by verse through everything, so I'm just pulling out relevant themes uh, that develop the ideas here. Um, but, it, you know, seriously, test everything we say, walk through this on your own, read through these verses. We're just pointing out the, the development of ideas here. So we're going to jump to verse 6 and um, read 6 through 8 is what it says. A voice says, cry, and I said said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Uh, So this is really fundamental for understanding what he's going to go on to say. Um, He's essentially saying, listen, flesh is temporary. Humanity is is temporary. We are temporary. Israel, the, the people that inhabit the southern kingdom of Judah, they're temporary. They're like grass. They're, they're here one moment, they're going to die when the scorching sun comes. People are temporary. Uh, what is not temporary? The word of the Lord. Um, the word of the Lord will stand forever. And I think that this serves a couple purposes. One, it establishes that what God has said in the past will certainly come to pass. His commitment to the people of Israel his promise, his covenant to them, what he's revealed in uh, the law about the curses and the blessings, all those things will come to pass. But it also serves to uh, as a foundation for what he's going to talk about uh, as Isaiah goes on. Comfort, uh, restoration, the hope of a new heavens and a new earth. All of these things that Isaiah goes on to talk about are certain. People are not certain. People are flaky, but the word of the Lord stands forever important to see. Any other thoughts? Uh, Totally. That was exactly it. Verse 10 and 11. I'm going to jump here. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. This uh, shows this, again, comfort, tenderness of God. He's going to care for his people. It's not as though God doesn't have people anymore after the destruction of Jerusalem and uh, of uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. God will tend his flock. He will care for his people. And so we have these, this, we've established this comfort, this peace, uh, and now um, God will go on to uh, explain through Isaiah the basis on which we can trust that God will do these things. He's going to now talk about himself. Um, Isaiah will talk about God, 
and what God is like and who he is as a basis for being able to believe and trust in the promises that he has made. Why you it is a blessing to be counted as the people of God because God is capable of doing these things because of his nature. So verse 12 uh, says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens uh, with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult, and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Especially verse 14 there is really, really crucial. This is saying that God is not dependent upon anyone else or any other being for his power and his knowledge. He is the one who has made all things, who measured and uh, marked off and weighed all of the mountains and the oceans and everything. But specifically... It says, who has taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Well, if God was a man who progressed through um, grace and grace and law and law and precept upon precept to where he's at, and he has a God, and he had to lay down his life in order to satisfy the demands of that God, just as Jesus did, then he certainly has someone who taught him the path of justice. Certainly he did. He had to grow in uh, grace and knowledge, just as uh, anyone else would have, just as we are. But that is not what is being said here. What is being said here is that God is has no need of anyone to tell him anything because he has all knowledge. Yeah. Listen, this is so contrary to what Joseph Smith was saying here. Very clear. Why can we trust that God will do these things because of his very nature, because of who he is. That's the, the context. That's why this is being brought, being brought up here. God is going to tend his flock. He's going to gather his lambs. He's, he's going to comfort his people. And you know what? God, we can trust because he is unlike anyone else. He is the one who has uh, all justice and all understanding and all knowledge. Uh, no one taught him that. This is cited in Romans 11. Actually, Paul ends Romans 11 with uh, a, a quote from this to talk about the nature of, uh, nature of God. God did not have a God who instructed him. God did not have a father who taught him. God did not learn from anyone else. God did not have to read a textbook about right, you know, philosophy of justice or whatever. God is justice. God is wisdom and knowledge. He never has developed a sense of justice. He always has had it. This is obviously and straightforwardly a statement of um, God's eternal, unchanging attributes. Uh, he's never developed this. He's never learned it. He's never gained it. He's always had it. That is simply incompatible with Mormonism. And the context here is not that uh, who taught you know, which of us has taught him the paths of justice? Which of us has taught him knowledge? No one, no one from us. Uh, if, if you add in the qualifier, well, that's only true for our universe. That robs this of its emphasis, of its oomph. The whole, the whole point he's making is that there is no being that has taught God this. That's why he is reliable and trustworthy. That's why he will do what he's said. Um, really, really significant. Um, Okay, let's jump to verse 17. Read the next couple of verses. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God or what likeness compare with him? An idol, a craftsman cr casts it and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it for silver, casts for its silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heaven like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness." 
So he begins here by talking about the nations are nothing before God. We agree. Nations are, are pitiful. The, the, the greatest powers of earth, Assyria, Babylon, can do nothing against God. They're, they're like grasshoppers, he'll go on to say. But then we have this intro statement in verse 18. To whom then will you liken God or who will you compare God to? That's the question being asked here. Well, what was it that the people were comparing God to? What is it that the Assyrian people compared the, the creator to? Well, to an idol. And then he goes on to talk about the ridiculousness, the stupidity of idolatry and of idols. A, a craftsman crafts it. Someone else have, has to form this idol. Uh, he chooses wood that will not rot. He sets up an idol that will not move. He's basically saying what you're doing in idolatry is you're comparing the matchlessness of God to this hunk of wood that can't move itself. That's absurd and outrageous and an affront to the nature of God. So he has just introduced this comparison here. The true nature of God versus the false nature of idols. So as he goes on, we're going to see this this play back and forth between idols and God, idols and God. Note also, so one of the things that is uh, attributed to the idol is that somebody has formed it, right? Mm -hmm. the, gra the, the craftsman cast it. The skilled craftsman is the one who carves it, right? So in, again, this is a contrast. So in contrast to the idols being formed by someone else and being contingent for their existence, God is not formed by anyone, and he is self-existent, right? Even think of us and what uh, David says or Jeremiah says that God forms us in our mother's womb, right? Just like the idol is formed by the craftsman, but God is not formed neither by a craftsman nor by a God. He is self-existent and formless. And, and we get that just exegetically, so we see this, because he's comparing the differences between God and the idol. So not this, but this. So if God is not formed by someone else, then he is not formed by someone else. Yeah, yeah. The idol is formed. God is not formed. Yeah. Um, let's jump down to verse uh, 25 and 26. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. So, again, in the, in the broader context, non, no nation, no idol can be compared to God. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him? This argument in Mormonism is such a weird argument because God is saying, to whom can you compare me? These people that will one day be able to be compared to me? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> the point being made here is the reason idolatry is absurd, the reason these nations are so boastful and arrogant is because they presume to be powerful like God. They presume to have attributes that God alone has. And God is saying, who are you going to compare me to? No one is like me. He'll go on to say that in more clear, explicit terms later. No one is like me. Not one person. You can't compare me to an idol. You can't compare me to a nation. You can't compare me to any of the other heavenly host. You can't compare me to any being. There are things true of God, not true of anyone else. If God could be compared to other humans that were exalted, then this loses all meaning. He's talking about nations, idols. It, it just it wouldn't have the oomph that it has. But again, this, it's worth noting, this is a cumulative argument. So if you're going to say, well, you could still weasel your way, <laughs> I, you wouldn't say that, I, I might say that, <laughs> weasel your way in to find a crack in that argument. This is a cumulative argument. Uh, these All these eight chapters, you have to deal with all the statements, not just one, all of them. That's really important. And a, a big part of why we want to do this, we're walking through all these chapters is because oftentimes, just because of, necessity, you kind of have to focus it on one verse. And then it's easy to, well, this, that, or the other. But we think a real problem in Mormonism is that they'll uh, fix on one particular verse. Well, doesn't uh, Paul talk about baptisms for the dead? 
It's like, well, sure, but what is he, what's going on there? What What is everything talking about? What's the whole story of uh, the Bible? What does all of Paul have to say, right? So when we present stuff like this and it's like, oh, well, you know, there's a way around that or that. It's like, no, read. We're, we're going to go through the whole thing. And what is the point of the entire message and how does that fit with the King Fall discourse? Yep. Really important what you said. Uh, okay, jumping down to uh, verse 28, just saying, have you not known... Uh, have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Uh, just that statement of everlasting God. He is the eternal God. What does everlasting mean? Um, it means without beginning or end. So if the Lord, if Yahweh, if Jehovah is the everlasting God, the everlasting Elohim, for the record, there's a note for the naming conve- conventions, uh, Jehovah is the everlasting Elohim. That's what this says. But the point here is that um, Jehovah never became an Elohim. He never became a God. He he is the everlasting God, the God without beginning or end. Let's continue on to chapter 41. Let's read verses 2 through 4. Isaiah says this, Who stirred up one from the east, whom victory meets at every step, He gives up nations before him so that he tramples kings underfoot. He makes them like dust with his sword, like driven stubble with his bow. He pursues them and passes on safely safely by paths his feet have not trod. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. Super important here, again, for the naming conventions, just to... Uh, keep, keep it straight in your head as you're trying to think of ways around this. Again, anytime you have the Lord, that's Jehovah or Yahweh. So I, Jehovah, the first and with the last, I I am he. So again, this is in, in a Mormon convention, this is Jesus being compared here, who is the first. So e- even if you want to say, well, this is God for the, the, just for us or something, that doesn't work too. Continue. Yeah, the... the the Mormon scheme has a number of elements here that are just not compatible with this. It's just incongruent. And let me just real quick pause and address this. You can find ways out of lots of these verses. You can adjust and modify definitions and try and do that. But you've got to ask yourself, is that what Isaiah is meaning to communicate? If you do all the gymnastics to try and make this fit with the Mormon scheme, have you really just believed what is straightforward and clear about this teaching? Or have you tried to make this fit within a Mormon context? We need to believe what God has revealed and use what God has said to test later revelation. So we use this to test what Joseph Smith said, what he taught. And if what Joseph Smith taught does not align with this, we don't twist Isaiah to match Joseph Smith. We say Joseph Smith is not a prophet. He was a false prophet. We ought to reject him and cling to what God has revealed here in Scripture. Anyways, continuing on, uh, we're going to read verses 21 through 29, the whole end of this chapter. Well, just to set this up... um a lot of what is going to be going on here is almost a courtroom trial where God is presenting his his case um, against the idols for why he is God alone and they are nothing. Um, and so he'll use uh, uh, language of, of present your case or try the idols or try me or something like that. Um, and so he's he's giving he's he's demonstrating uh, very logically and methodologically how he is unlike everything else and why his promises and what he declares is sure and why every other deity and every other place that you might put your hope in is a false hope. So we'll start in verse twenty one. It says, "Set forth your case," says the Lord. "Bring your proofs," says the King of Jacob. Let them bring them and tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things, what they are, that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Do good or do harm, that we may be dismayed and terrified. Behold, you are nothing, and your work is less than nothing. An abomination is he who chooses you. 
I stirred up one from the north, and he has come, from the rising of the sun, and he shall call upon my name. He shall trample on rulers as on mortar and the potter tre- as the potter treads clay. Who declared it from the beginning that we might know, and beforehand that we might say he is right? There was none who declared it, none who proclaimed, none who heard your words. I was the first to say to Zion, behold, here they are, and I give to Jerusalem a herald of good news. But when I look, there is no one. Among these, there is no counselor who, when I ask, gives an answer. Behold, they are all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their metal images are empty wind. So as Garrett said, this is pointing to the nature of idols compared with the nature of God. That's what he sets forth and uh, God is saying to the idols, okay, bring your case, idols. Let's see. Tell us uh, what's going to happen, idols. T- tell us about the future. In fact, he says in verse 22, tell us the former things, what they are, that we may consider them. So idols, if you exist, tell us what happened. You don't even have to tell us the future. Tell us what happened so that we can know what happened. If you were here, if you're, if you're a god, tell us what happened. At verse 40, uh, 24, behold, you are nothing. Your work is less than nothing. Then he talks about what God has done. I stirred up one from the north. He goes on, uh, who declared it? Speaking again about the idols. Who declared it from the beginning that we might know and beforehand that we might say he is right? There was none who declared it. None heard your words. Um, Verse 27, God says, I was the first to say to Zion, behold, here they are. I gave to Jerusalem a herald of good news. God is saying, I have spoken. I have revealed myself. I am the God who speaks to my people. What are you, idols? Verse 29 is the, the kicker here. Behold, they are a delusion. They, they don't even exist. Their works are nothing. Their metal images are empty wind. So we see this contrast between God and idols. And that is just going to continue this argument uh, into chapter 42, starting with verse 5. Uh, this is what God says of himself. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations to to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. This is... 42 verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and the new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So, this is, if the end of chapter 41 was all the that idols can't do, this is all that God does. Verse five, he created the heavens, he stretched them out, he spread out the earth, he gives breath to the people and spirit to those who walk in it. God is the origin of life and breath of, uh, he says in verse five, spirit. He is the, the origin of spirit for those who walk on the earth. He says, I am the Lord, I am Jehovah, I am Yahweh. Uh, And then verse eight, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. There are two categories here that he introduces. One builds off the other. The first statement, my glory I give to no other, is a broad statement. He does not give glory to others. And then he builds on that for the specific case he's making, nor my praise to carved idols. So he's talking about idolatry, but he makes a general statement. My glory I give to no other. This is not true in Mormonism. That general statement's not true. God glorifies and exalts humans. He does. But here he says, my glory I give to no other. Now, someone will say, but what about Jesus? Does God not give glory to Jesus? To which we would respond, well, Jesus is God. (laughs) So it's not that God is a separate being from Jesus, has given him a kind of glory. God has has glorified himself in all that he's done. Father, Son, and Spirit all glorify one another. um, And therefore, we don't have this problem of God having to give his glory to an external being. God is glorifying himself. 
So that's not a problem for Trinitarians, but it is a problem for Mormons. That's really great because, yeah, uh, you know, we get that all the time. Well, didn't God give his glory to Jesus? Well, yes. But again, our argument we always make is that the purpose of everything, the purpose of us, of creation, of what God does, is to glorify himself, right? So when the Father glorifies Jesus and Jesus glorifies the Father and the Spirit conforms a people to the image of Christ so that Christ can present them holy and blameless to his Father, that is each member of the Trinity glorifying each other, which is God glorifying himself. So even in the, the inter-Trinitarian workings of God, it is him glorifying himself, not just in his external acts, but even the internal acts within himself. It is all about glorifying himself, which is the ultimate good in the world because he is the source of all good, light, and truth. Also, something really cool. So here, uh, there are two things in this passage really that's being established. One is the basis, uh, is what it is that God uh, does for his people and creation, and two, the basis on which that's true, right? So he says that he will. He is called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. Um, I will bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, right? Why do, is he the one who is able to do that? Is it because he is the one who uh, has kept to the eternal law and because he is righteous um, and uh, has grown to the point that now he has earned the right to be able to do this? Is that why? Because he is an exalted man that he is able to do these things? No. It's because, thus says God the Lord, the one who stretched out the heavens, uh, the one who spread out the earth, the one who gives breath and life. It is because he is the creator that he is able to do things. The basis on which God argues that he is able to save and rescue and make righteous is because of his nature as creator, which is really important and not something that Mormonism can say. Being the creator does, in Mormonism does not give and a God the right to do as he wills with his creation. It is adherence to the eternal law that makes him God and that he is bound to follow when uh, interacting with his creation. That's incredibly important to understand the difference there. Also, again, he then ends the same way. Why does he say, I am the Lord, that is my name, and uses that as the basis that he does not give his glory to another? Well, remember, the the name Yahweh, Jehovah, is I am. So I am the Lord. I am that I am, as he says to Moses, right? I am the one who is. I am the self-existent one. So I am me. I am the creator. I am being. And my glory I will not give to another because of the nature of who I am as creator. Really important. If we continue on in uh, chapter 42, uh, after this statement of what God does, he, he, in verse 10, he says, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. And he goes on, verse 12, let them give glory to the Lord, uh, and declare his praise. Uh, so just an expression of, hey, we need to praise God because of this. This is who God is. And the fact that he doesn't share glory means we should worship him and give him glory. Uh, that is our, our obligation. Uh, the Lord is uh, glorious and wondrous and mighty and worthy of praise. Um, uh, he continues on uh, in verse 18 through 25. He really talks about uh, the blindness of Israel, the, the problems of Israel. That Israel is... Um, uh, has seen tons of things, has said prophets and all this, and yet has been uh, dull and hard of hearing, and has not recognized all that they should have. They've not acknowledged God like they should have. Um, and, and that brings us to chapter 43. So I'm going to read 43 verses 1 and 2, and then we'll jump to verse 6 and 7. It says, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, again, coming out of the context of all that is wrong with Israel, um, this is what he says. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God. I am the Jehovah, your Elohim, <laughs> the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Uh, he continues on. 
Verse 6, I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who was called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So he's talking about Israel and Jacob after saying that Israel is uh, dumb and blind and mute. Uh, he says, but I will restore them. I will protect them. Uh, I will return them from exile one day from Babylon. I will call them from the ends of the earth and restore them. And then he clarifies who he's talking about in verse seven. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made, whom I formed and made. I have seen a number of comments and things on Facebook of people criticizing uh, godless Mormons and uh, Christians in general for this idea that uh, well, God does things for his own glory. Or they say, well, Christians don't really know why humanity exists or what we're made for or what is the purpose of all of this. Um, and that's just not true. God's really clear. God does this for his glory. And if you think that that's wrong, the problem is that you hate God in your heart. That's what the Bible identifies as the problem, the root problem of man. We don't love God. We hate him. We are his enemies. We're opposed to him. We seek to tear down his rule and reign. God is the only one who rightfully deserves glory and praise. And everything he does is to exemplify his nature and his attributes. That's why he acts. That's why he's calling Israel out of exile. That's why he saves us. That's why he sent Christ. That's why he does everything. It is not, it would not be right for us to do things for our own sake because we're not God. He is God. He can rightly do that. And it is wrong for us to seek to oppose that. So I'm doubling down on this. It is true. God does things for his own sake and own glory. That's what he said. That's what he said. You really need to listen to us here. If, because in a Mormon system where the point of man, what is the point of everything? Who are we? Where are we going? What are we doing here? Well, the point is to exalt ourselves and to gain God's glory. God exists in order to glorify us and to give us glory. Of course, that sounds seductive because you are worshiping yourself. The object of your desire is yourself and so you seek to see yourself glorified because whatever you love most is that which you want to see receive most praise and honor and we don't say that to be mean or hateful we say that because it is true and because you will find the most uh joy in god's presence doing what you were created to do. The psalmist says that in your presence, God, is fullness of joy. So you want to be happy. You want to have joy. Do what you were meant to do. You have a purpose. Your purpose is to glorify your creator, not yourself. It is not to uh, enjoy your family forever. The purpose of your existence is not procreation. The purpose of your existence is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Amen. I'm thinking of Ecclesiastes. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is all about, I think King Solomon wrote it, um, but it's all about we pursue all these things in life to satisfy us. Uh, we, we strive after, in, in Ecclesiastes, in Solomon's case, power, uh, wealth, sex, uh, and he says, none of those things satisfy me. They were vanity. They're chasing after the wind. What is his conclusion? The whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. The whole, the whole purpose of what we ought to do is to live the life that God has granted us, uh, to toil, uh, not, not for ourselves, not, not so that we can gain some enjoyment out of our, or, uh, not so that we can gain ultimate satisfaction out of our toil, but because it's what God has given for us to do. We do what God has given for us to do. The ultimate top level thing God has given for us to do is glorify him. And so there's no greater satisfaction in life than to bring him glory. It is for your great benefit to recognize that the purpose of all things is to glorify God. If you don't recognize that, you will never be satisfied. Yeah, you, you are not big enough to ever be satisfied with your own exaltation and glory. You're too small of a creature for, that to, for you to ever be satisfied with your ultimate end being yourself and your own glorification. You will never, ever, ever 
find peace and satisfaction. You were created for a higher purpose than that. There is a being who is so far above you that you have a Lord and a master and you are to come under his mission, the mission of God in the story that he is telling throughout history. And you are called to be a part of that and to work for something so much farther above yourself. We all have an innate uh, desire for that. Um, it seems in we want to work for family or for country or for our job or to we, we want to uh, establish things. But so much greater than any earthly thing we can conceive of is working to um, help God to uh, accomplish the purpose that he is working for as he works in us to accomplish that purpose. Continuing on in verse 8 through 13, um, Isaiah records uh, God saying this, "'Bring out the people who are blind yet have eyes.'" who are deaf yet have ears. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right. Let them hear and say it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me, there is no savior." I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Also, henceforth, I am he, and there is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? Um, okay, so he, he sets, off, uh, sets up this kind of, um, again, courtroom image here. It says, all the nations gather together, uh, peoples assemble, bring your witnesses to prove you right, prove that your yourselves or that your idols have done things, that they're significant, call your witnesses to the stand. As for me, I call Israel. It's 43.10. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen. God says, I call Israel to the stand because you know and believe, uh, that you may know and believe and understand that I am he. That's a somewhat ambiguous term. I am who? I, I am he? that I am God, that I'm the, the creator of heaven and earth, that I'm the true God. And then he says the verse that we quote probably more than any other verse with respect to uh, Mormonism and exaltation. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Critics of uh, us always say, well, this is uh, saying that uh, idols don't exist. And it is true. This whole section is taught comparing what's true of God against what's true of idols. But replace this with idols. If you think that this is talking about idols, this is what God is saying. Before me, no idol was formed, and after, there, uh, nor shall there be any after me. That doesn't make sense. Obviously, there were idols formed um, while God has existed. So what God is saying is the reason idols don't exist is because no other gods exist. No other gods now, someone else will bring up, well, uh, the Old Testament speaks about the existence of other gods. Uh, we have, you know, these other gods talked about. It's worth noting that it is true. The Old Testament uses the term Elohim to refer to uh, more than just God, uh, Heavenly Father. You know, um, it, it refers to heavenly beings on occasion, to angels and the hosts of heaven, and even on occasion, exalted human rulers. Uh, on, on, that, that's rare, but it does happen. Most of the time, it's talking about God, but it does have that uh, range of talking about angelic beings. But it's worth noting here that the context of what he's talking about is that there's no God like him. There's no God like him. And if the whole premise of Mormonism is that uh, God was once a man who progressed to where he's, he, he is now and we can become uh, just like God, then that doesn't fit with this at all. The whole point he's saying is though other, you know, though heavenly beings might certainly exist, though angels exist as a class of being true, um, no God like God has been formed before him. No God who stretched out the heavens by himself. No God who can certainly bring to pass all that he has declared. No God who tells of things to come and things past. No God like him exists. No God was formed before him. No God will be formed after him. That's not true in Mormonism. The context here, though talking about idols, is referencing 
the true nature of God and defending that true nature of God. It goes back to what he said earlier here. Who are you going to liken God to? To whom will you compare God to? No one. Again, just we got to read what Joseph Smith said again. Here then is eternal life, to know the only wise and true God, and you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you. So Isaiah here, God in Isaiah says that before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. But Joseph Smith says that you must do the same as all of the gods before you have done in order for you to become a God. There is no way around this. If you try to twist the words and come up with an excuse, that's all you're doing. There is no way that you simply read what God has revealed and come away with the direct, exact, almost word-for-word opposite opinion that Joseph Smith here says. You cannot do it. And if you try and if you listen to what we're saying, reject it, and instead accept what Joseph Smith has said here, you are simply doing it because you've rejected what God has declared. You need to understand that. Um, This chapter goes on to talk about how... um uh, the Lord has done wondrous things, uh, that uh, all the, he's sovereign over every category of thing, that the wild beasts honor him, the jackals, the ostrich, ostriches, um, because of his works. Um, yet Israel did not honor him, they did not serve him. Then verse 25, it says, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember um, your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us argue together. Set forth your case that you may be proved right. Your first father sinned and your mediators transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princes of the sanctuary and deliver Jacob to utter destruction and Israel to reviling. So God says, I blot out your transgressions. I forgive you for my own sake and I will not remember your sins. And then he says, ultimately, you can bring your case forward, but listen, uh, you've sinned, and I, the Lord, will deliver you to utter destruction. So God will deliver them to utter, utter destruction, and when God forgives their sins, he does it for his own sake. Okay, let's press on to chapter 44. Uh, let's go down to verse 6. Um, this is what it says. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I'm the first and I'm the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. I know not any. And uh, I'm going to keep reading. Okay, I'll stop real quick, and I want to keep reading. I don't want to belabor this too much because I think we need to get the flow of why he's saying this as he goes into the next section. He says he's the first, last, no God but him, and that he doesn't know of any other gods. That simply doesn't square with anything the LDS Church teaches. Heavenly Father knows of Heavenly Mother. Heavenly Father knows of his Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father knows of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father knows of the Holy Ghost. Heavenly Father knows of us who can be exalted. It is not true that he doesn't know of a God other than himself. That's just not true. Compare this with what God supposedly said in DNC uh, 132, where he says, uh, they will be gods. Uh, here he says, is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. That does not sound like the same God. But let's continue on. I want to read this section with that in mind. Isaiah 44, verse 9 says, All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. Verse 12. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with a strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line and he marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He cuts down cedars or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes a fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a God and worships it. He makes it 
an, uh, he makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also he warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. They know not, nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. No one considers, nor is their knowledge or discernment to say, half of it I burned in the fire, I also baked bread on its coals, I roasted meat and have eaten, and shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes, a deluded heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? So God starts off this section by talking about himself. This is what's true of me. I'm the first. I'm the last. Besides me, there is no God. There is nothing like God. The reason that's important is because he's talking about the, the nature of idols, how, how ridiculous it is. And he continues to hammer the ridiculousness. But one of the hallmarks of idols is that there's lots of them. Man makes lots of idols. He pumps them out. He falls down and worships them. An idol is not unique. An idol is a dime a dozen. Every man fashions his idol and bows down before it, and it's ridiculous. Not so with God. There's nothing like God. There's tons of things like idols. There's nothing like God. The, the um, context here strengthens the point that we're trying to make because it's showing the contrast, the difference. Any other thoughts, sir? Should we keep trucking on? Let's go. Keep trucking on. Uh, let's jump to verse 24. We'll read 24 through 28. He says, thus says the Lord, your redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. I'm actually, I'm not going to go on to continue reading just for sake of time, because that's the relevant section right there. The Lord made all things. Jehovah made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. This whole idea that the Lord created with the, the counsel of gods, everything is just not supported by this. I don't, know, I don't know how much more clear you get with this verse. God says, I alone stretch out the heavens who spread out the earth by myself. No one helped God. He did it by himself. Again, also note, it says that I am the Lord, Jehovah Yahweh, who made all things and stretched out the heavens by myself. So again, you, we see this, this conflict and contradiction between trying to play games of Elohim versus Jehovah, just to point it out. Um, and again, like I, I pointed out earlier, as David and uh, Jeremiah says, here we see it again, that the Lord forms us in the womb, but unlike us and the idols who are formed, uh, in contrast, God is not formed. Continuing on to chapter 45, I'm going to read two, uh, verses 2 through 7. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in the pieces, I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. Just talking about God's power. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes and secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, again, the Jehovah, the Elohim of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Uh, he'll go on to talk about how uh, the, the heavens should shower, the clouds should rain down righteousness, uh, the earth should do what God says because the Lord created it. Um, but we have these clear statements. Besides me, there is no God. A and then he describes who he is. He's the God who forms light and darkness, who makes well-being, creates calamity. He's the Lord who does those things. So when he says, besides me, there is no God, he's giving us the parameters to understand what he means. Is there another God who forms light and darkness? Is there another God who makes well-being and creates calamity? No, there's no God besides him. And this is part of what we mean about that cumulative argument. We see over and over and over 
Is there a God beside me? I know not one. There is no God beside me. I am the first. I am the last, right? And every time that that statement is made, it's not just for the sake of repetition, although repetition there is really important, but it's he's it's a thesis and an argumentation, something to back it up, a foundation, and then what comes from that, right? So I am the Lord besides me. There is no God, meaning I'm the one who forms light and darkness. That's something specifically unique to me, right? So you know, when uh, we hear rebuttals, well, you know, there's no other God for this world. Well, he doesn't just say that there's no other God. Um, He explains what it means for there to not be any other God. So if in your system, there is another one who forms light and creates darkness, then that means that there is another God besides God because God is claiming that is a, as a unique prerogative of him as the only God. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, jumping down to verse 15. Truly, you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, the Savior. All of them are put to shame and confounded. The makers of idols go in confusion together, but Israel is saved by the Lord with everlasting salvation. You shall not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity. Um, so it seems like this is Isaiah speaking. He's saying, you're a God who hides himself. All the nations, they're put to shame because of their idols, but Israel is saved by the Lord. Israel's not put to shame. Then verse 18 of chapter 45. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God, who formed the earth and made it, he established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. Um, jump down to verse 20. It says, assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a savior. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Again, this contrast between idols and God. He just says again and again, there is no God besides me. And for the record, is it true there's no God besides him for us? Yes, but that that argument is weakened if you're saying that's the only thing he's saying. He's saying there's no God at all that exists beside him. That's why there's no God but him for us. The reason we should only worship uh, Jehovah, Yahweh, the only reason we should worship him is because he's the only one that actually exists. That's his argument. If other gods existed, you'd have to ask the question, why can't we worship him? Because his argument here is not why we should only worship him amongst all the other gods that exist. His argument is we should only worship him because he's the only God that exists. Also, again, we have this statement that there is no, uh, uh, no other God. And then we see, what does that result in? What does it mean that there's no other God? Well, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, meaning the highest authority by which God can swear is yeah. himself, not a God above him. From my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow Every tongue shall swear allegiance. So what does it mean that God is the only God? It means that every knee shall bow and tongue swear allegiance to him. That's verse 23. Now, again, in the Mormon system, just like we just read from Joseph Smith, we are seeking to become God so that we can receive all the glory and exaltation that God has, such that someday every knee will bow and every tongue swear allegiance to the exalted man. But... This is what God claims is his divine divine prerogative, is this exclusive uh, praise, worship, and adoration. There is none besides me. And because of that, every you will bow and tongue swear allegiance. So again, we see what is that it's not a simple em- empty statement, open-ended. God explains what it means and what the result is that he is the only God. And so any system that results in anyone ever receiving allegiance and worship and praise other than God alone is a false system according to God himself. Chapter 46, you can read verses 5 through 11. He begins, um, I was looking at verse 3 real quick. He just says, listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel. Um, 
So he's basically saying, hey, Israel, listen to me. And then he begins this in verse 5. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we should be alike? Before I go on, <laughs> he's saying to Israel, who are, you going to, who are you going to say is like me? Who are you going to compare me to? That is, I mean, th- this is a, uh, uh, I need to start uh, citing this more maybe on the street because let's just say Jesus in the Mormon system. Heavenly Fathers, you can compare Heavenly Father to Jesus, or Jesus to Heavenly Father if you say that, uh, you know, this is the Lord speaking, Jehovah speaking. Um, That's even more problematic, but uh, there are, I mean, this is just so contrary to what Joseph Smith was saying. His whole point was God can be compared to Jesus and to us and to his God before him. We will be able to be compared to God uh, his whole point is, a, is a, it, the whole sermon is a statement of comparison. We'll be like him. We'll be able to be compared to him. We'll have what he has. So contrary to this, to whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? There is no one like God. No one like God. Continuing on in verse six, those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver in the scales, hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god. Then they fall down and worship. They lift it to their shoulders and they carry it. They set it in its place and it stands there. It cannot move from its place. If one cries to it, it does not answer or save him from his trouble. So again, he's pointing out the absurdity of idolatry by talking about his own nature. Why are these idols so ridiculous? Not just because they can't walk, not just because they can't speak or hear, but because no one can be compared to God. These idols are basically saying that the infinite matchlessness of God can be compared to this hunk of wood. This hunk of wood is so wicked because God is so matchless and so uncomparable uh, to any other being. Just to build off of um, what you were saying there, a, a common objection that we'll get when, uh, when I'll point out things like that the, the wickedness of believing that you will someday be worshipped like God, they'll say, well, we believe that we will always be less than our Father. We never believe that we will be above Him. And if further on from what we read earlier, Joseph Smith uh, says something very similar to that. Speaking of God, it says, He will then take a higher exaltation, and I will take His place, and thereby become exalted myself. Um, so, yes, it's true um, that Joseph Smith teaches this sort of hierarchy of, of uh, gods and that we will always be subject to God the Father and that as we become exalted, he'll take a higher thing to himself. But compare that here and try to fit that with what Bradley just read. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? Now, if God was once a man who existed and had a father, then that means that when God became exalted, his father took a higher place and authority over him. So forget whom are you going to compare to God and make equal to him. There's an infinite number of beings, an infinite number of beings who are higher in glory and authority and exaltation than God. That is, does not work. It is incredibly wicked. It is not what God has revealed here. And a lo- I hear lots of people saying, well, that's very much speculation. We don't know about, you know, if there's a heavenly grandfather or anything like that. We just, we haven't been revealed um, details of uh, past uh, life of heavenly father. But, I mean, if we're to take Joseph Smith at his word and the the way he talks about that, the, the heavy implication there is certainly that God had a God. And for someone who says we don't like to think about it, that is outrageous to me because even Joseph Smith said one of the first things, the nature and characteristics of God, that's, that's a high priority to consider. Uh, th- these are the kinds of things that will make or break the entire Mormon faith. They should be thought about. They should be considered. If it is true that God has a God above him, then uh, that is, that is a huge problem with what the Bible says. So you need to consider those things, even if it's not been fully revealed. Look at the implications of what the prophets have said. Compare all the little details between what different prophets have said about the issue, uh, and then look at what the Bible says. It's worth studying out. Okay, um, continuing on in 46 verse 8. He says, remember this, stand firm, recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east 
the man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. Same kind of statements. I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Uh, no one, and then again, he, he defines what it means to not be like him. No other being can declare the end from the beginning. No other being can declare ancient from the ancient times things not done. No other being can make sure their counsel stands. No other being will certainly accomplish all their purpose. Only God can do that. Chapter 47 um, talks a lot about uh, Babylon and um, the, the heading of, in my uh, Bible says, the humiliation of Babylon. Uh, there's only one thing I want to point out in this um, because it's brought up a lot in, uh, with respect to a lot of the statements of uh, there's no God but, uh, but him. Uh, what, what, what verse is it here? Looking, it's, I'm going to read 5 through... Oh, it's in, um, yeah, 5 through 9. That's what I'm going to look at. Chapter 47, verse 5 through 9 says, Sit in silence and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no more be called the mistress of kingdoms. I was angry with my people. I profaned my heritage. I gave them into your hand. You showed them no mercy. On the age you made your yoke exceedingly heavy. You said, I shall be mistress forever, so that you did not lay these things to heart or remember their end. Now, therefore, hear this, you lover of pleasures who sit securely. Just to summarize, God is saying, you Babylonians, you Chaldeans who have come up against uh, Judah, this is the judgment coming for you. Verse 8, hear this, you lover of pleasures who sit securely, who say in your heart, I am and there is no one besides me. I shall not sit as a widow or know the loss of children. That's what Babylon says of itself. These two things shall come to you in a moment, in one day, the loss of children and widowhood shall come upon you in full measure, in spite of your many sorceries and the great power of your enchantment, enchantments. So in verse 8, this is what Babylon is saying in its heart. I am, and there is no one besides me. That's what Babylon says. And then God says in response in verse 9, these two things shall come to you in a moment, in one day, the loss of children and widow. Uh, shall come upon you in full measure. So lots of people say, well, the statement that uh, I am and there's none besides me that God makes throughout Isaiah, does not Babylon say the same thing about itself? And obviously there are other cities. And that's such an ironic statement to me because the whole point is God is saying, I'm destroying you, Babylon, for your arrogance because you say I am and there is no one besides me. But there is because you are not matchless. You are not like the Almighty One. The whole point of the context of this is that Babylon does say that there's none besides it, and God judges them for it. So for all the, the I'm pretty sure this is what Fair Mormon says. I think it's Fair Latter-day Saint now. Uh, but I think this is what they say in response to some of the earlier texts in Isaiah. They say, well, ancient cities, in, uh, not just here in Isaiah, but in other places in the Old Testament will say this about themselves. Um, the whole point is that God judges them for that because it's not true, because it's their pride on display. It's not God's pride on display. It's true of him. Um, and so that's a really not a great uh, argument to make. Um, because it's not true of them, and that's why God judges them. Uh, it says the same thing in verses 10 through 11. At the end of 10, he says, uh, I'll just read verse 10. You felt secure in your wickedness. You said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge led you astray, and you said in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. But evil shall come upon you, which you will not know how to charm away. Disaster shall fall upon you, so on and so forth. It's also found of uh, Nineveh elsewhere in the Bible. It might be Isaiah 2. It might be... Jeremiah, I don't remember. Sorry, I don't have it listed here. But in the same con uh, Nineveh says the same thing about itself in the context of God judging Nineveh for their arrogance. So these statements are not meant to say that we should invalidate what God says of himself, um, but it helps us understand why God judged Babylon and Assyria. And he did judge Babylon and Assyria. The they don't exist today, uh, but God's people still exist. And then we'll end... Um, with chapter 48, I'm going to read verses 5 through uh, 11. No, I'm sorry, 5 through 13, last section. Um, I declared them to you from of old. Before they came to pass, I announced them to you, lest you should say my idol did them, my carved image and my metal image commanded them. You have heard, now see all this, and will you not declare it? From this time forth, I announce to you new things, hidden things that you have not known. 
They are created now, not long ago. Before today, you have never heard of them, lest you should say, Behold, I knew them. You have never heard, you have never known. From of old, your ear has not been opened. For I knew that you would surely deal treacherously, and that from before birth you were called a rebel. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. Listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, whom I called. I am he, I am the first, and I am the last. My hand laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand forth together. So he's speaking to Israel. He's saying, I'm going to tell you of things that you've not heard. Therefore, you can't claim an idol told you because it was me that told you about it. And then he says in 9 through 11, for my name's sake, I defer my anger. I restrain my wrath for the sake of my praise. God does not cut off his people for his own sake. Um, and then he ends, for, my, for how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. Not to an idol, not to a human, not to anyone. God will not share his glory. He alone is the matchless king of heaven and earth. So all these chapters, I think, form a really clear image of who God is. There only ever has been and only ever will be one creator God. He's eternal. He's unchanging. He alone stretched out the heavens and formed the earth. He is not like the idols. And the reason he's different than the idols is because he speaks, he acts, he knows things that came before and things that came after. He cannot be compared to any other being. There are lots of idols in the world, but there are not lots of gods that exist. There's only one being like him who does all the things that God does. That's incompatible with what Joseph Smith taught, and that's incompatible with modern Mormonism. It's worth noting that we have brought up lots of things from the King Follett uh, uh, sermon because it's just a helpful summary, but our argument is not necessarily just against this old document. You might say, hey, I totally disagree with Joseph Smith, which is a problem for a different reason, but that's for another video. Um, that's fine. What we're doing is just showing this is the predominant Latter-day Saint thinking. He says it in very clear terms that's easy to show the contrast between. But what we really want to deal with is what you believe as the person listening to this or watching this. If you think that God was once a man, if you think that he had a heavenly father, if you think that men can become gods, then I ple I'm pleading with you, heed the word of the Lord in Isaiah chapters 40 through 48. Turn away from that belief and believe what God says of himself. He alone is God. He can't be compared to anyone else. There was no God before him. There's no God after him. And you can be saved for his glory and thus have an eternal satisfaction as uh, one who is a trophy of the grace and mercy of God. I've talked a lot, Garrett. Do you have anything to add? That was a great summary. Amen. Well, thank you guys so much for watching this. Um, thank you for your support. Uh, we'd love to do more of these long form uh, walking through big texts of scripture. If you have a particular topic or texts that you'd like us to walk through, then uh, throw them below in the comments. As always, be sure to like, share this video, um, and uh, leave any questions, pushback, comments, other topics you'd like us to address uh, below. And thanks for watching. May God be glorified and honored and pleased by uh, us seeking him through what he's revealed in his word. I urge you, please read Isaiah 40 through 48, meditate on those chapters, and consider who God is. Thank you.